Okay, so um, I think we have, let me just, okay. Um, uh, yeah, that, this is a good moment to start. Um, well, so again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this might sound a bit of a deja vu for, well, <laughs> some of you or most of you, but of course we cannot, we cannot go ahead without uh, a proper introduction to, to our uh, speaker of today. Um, and I really, I cannot stress enough uh, what a pleasure it is to be introducing Professor Frank Lehman. Um, Professor Frank Lehman is, uh, since 2004, a full professor of computer science at the University of Stuttgart in Germany, uh, where he has founded the, the Institute of Architecture of Application Systems. Um, professor Lehman received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Bochum, also in Germany in 1984. Uh, and he then worked for IBM Research and Development, where he contributed to great products such as DB2, WebSphere, or MQ series. Um, he was main co-inventor and chief, chief software architect of IBM's business process management and workflow products, contributions for which he was appointed IBM Distinguished uh, Engineer. Professor Lehman um, has an amazing publication record, uh, having published four books, over 15 book chapters, more than 100 journal papers, and over 350 conference papers, which might be already, uh, well, um, not, not updated. Um, he has also co-authored about 70 patents and several industry standards, um, and he's an elected member of the Academy of uh, Europe a fellow of the Center for Integrated Quantum Science and Technology, and a Kurt Gödel uh, visiting professor for quantum computing at, at the Technical University of Vienna. Uh, his research interests include um, quite broad, uh, well, uh, aspects, namely software architecture, a robust, robustness of highly distributed applications, middleware, pattern languages, and uh, of course, and most relevant for today, uh, quantum computing. Um, Professor Lehman has made substantial contributions specifically to this field. Um, and I would highlight his involvement in the Planck project, which is um, the, uh, well, uh, the name of the project is a platform and ecosystem for quantum assisted uh, artificial intelligence and Professor Lehman acts in this project as, as scientific director. So the vision behind this, this platform, the platform um, within Planck UC or Planck Q, is that users will be able to access a quantum app store um, uh, while developers will also be able to use quantum platforms in a simple way. Um, and specialists will be able to provide concepts that uh, will make quantum computing easily accessible. Um, out of all this, and I, I, I do not get tired of mentioning this, Professor Lehman has, has been amazingly fast in responding to all our, uh, all our solicitations, and I, I really mean all. And um, well, also for this, I, I would like to... Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, I, I, I didn't hear your last word, so something happened. But could you hear my introduction? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. on, the, on the last couple of sentences. Ah, so okay. th thank you very, very much for the very kind introductory call. Yeah, thank you very much. So I hope this time uh, we will make it, right? So the, the title, as you see, is The Bitter Truth About Quantum Algorithm in the NISC Era. And this basically resulted from the experience we got over the last nearly two years with running real quantum applications in the Planck project that Rao basically mentioned. And you find uh, the stuff that I'm uh, presenting here and much more in the article that you see at the bottom of the page. So what are the current technological problems that we have with quantum computers? Well, first of all, we all know 
that uh, today's quantum computers suffer from decoherence. That means the qubits are not stable. The, uh, the state of the qubits decay over time that, uh, and implementations of qubits disturb each other and increasing the number of qubits is very, very difficult as, as we all know. Next problem basically is the gate infidelity. Gate infidelity means that each operation is a little bit imprecise. We will discuss that in, the, in, in a minute. That means errors in quantum algorithm increase with the number of operations you need to perform and only algorithms with a few operations these days can be executed precisely. And we also have readout errors. That means measurements of qubits are imprecise. That means the, the results that you get from a quantum computer are typically distorted. That means you need to try to correct them. Finally, we need to cope with qubit connectivity because not all qubits in a quantum processing unit, a QPU, are physically connected. This is especially important if you need to run two qubit uh, op operations. Um, and you need two qubit operations. They are mandatory in a set of universal operations. That means you need to introduce additional operations as we will see in, in the course of this presentation. So as Rao basically mentioned, uh, this kind of, of, of cruel world is the basis for the project that is called Planck. And Planck, as we heard, is about determining whether and how quantum machine learning can be successfully exploited today in such an error prone environment. So let's now dive deeper into the cruel world. So what about decoherence? So this is a reminder. You heard that in a couple of the pro in the presentations in the QC talks before, if you have a qubit, you can basically rewrite the qubit so that the coefficients with base vector zero and one are like this. So you have two different angles here, the angle theta and the angle rho that basically determine the coefficients with the base vectors and you can pictorial represent then the qubit by taking the, uh, the angle rho from the x axis and the angle theta from the z axis and then you result with a point on a unit sphere in three dimensional space. And this is an extremely nice pictorial representation because if you remember alpha and beta are complex numbers, that means the state of a qubit is in a four dimensional space in a two, di in a, in a two dimensional complex space. And this thing here basically allows me to represent this four dimensional thing on a two dimensional surface. Very fantastic. So, and taking a look at the Bloch sphere, if you have a qubit on the Bloch sphere, it may basically collapse. It may, it may transit from to in, in, into an orthogonal state, into a diametral state. This is called the T1 time, the relaxation time. And the qubit in addition may a little bit jitter. It may not collapse from one uh, into an orthogonal state, but it may jitter a little bit. So the phases, the coefficients may a little bit change here, some, some of the angle. This is a random change in the phase. We call it the phasing time. Here you see some typical uh, T1 and T2 times. So uh, two years ago, you had this system so the T2 time, the T1 time was uh, about 60 microseconds. In the meantime, uh, we have quantum volume two, a measurement that IBM did um, introduce. Uh, we have 107 microseconds uh, of the uh, coherence time of a, of a qubit and the T2 time, the dephasing time is about 160 microseconds. So it is increased year after year as the technology does uh, get better. So the idea would basically be, well, why can't we apply error correction uh, to correct the errors? Because in the classical computer, these kind of errors do happen too. Well, the problem is uh, some of the error correction algorithm classical com computers rely on making redundant copies of a qubit. You can't do that because we have something that's called the no cloning theorem. So you can't copy qubit. The other problem is that the errors that are happening are not discrete errors. So a, a, like a classical bit that switches from zero to one or from one to zero, as we said, the qubit can basically jitter. You have continuous errors. So all the applications, uh, the, all the error corrections that we have doesn't apply. The next thing is some error correction algorithms in classical world uh, rely on measuring bits, but you can't measure qubits. If you measure a qubit, you destruct its state. That means this kind of technology can't be applied either. So this is terrible, right? The next thing is gate fidelity. How, how error prone are the uh, different gates? So here is something that you learn in the, in the first couple of weeks in quantum computing. Each one qubit operator 
can be rewritten as a set of rotations. The R's are rotations on the Bloch sphere, right? You rotate uh, around the angle beta around the z-axis, for example, and so on. So one qubit operators are composition of rotations on the Bloch sphere. And these kind of rotations are universal for one qubit operators. That means each operator on a qubit really corresponds to this uh, composition of rotations. What that basically means is if you have, if you take a look at the single uh, rotation, the rotation is around an angle theta, but the angle theta typically is not a rational number. That means you cannot really precisely rotate uh, the qubit of, uh, of an, around an irrational angle. That means rotations are inherently imprecise. And that means that the composition of the rotation, that means a single qubit operation always have a, has a small error. Right, this is an inherent problem. That basically means if you have a quantum algorithm, the quantum algorithm typically consists out of a bunch of unitary operations. So what you would like to get is the true result phi t that, is, uh, uh, that comes out of phi zero, the initial state, then you apply the algorithm here. But because each of the UI is a little bit imprecise as we said before, that means instead of UI, the imprecise operation UI tilde is performed. And if you apply if you apply the first gate instead of resulting in phi one, you get u uh, one tilde of phi zero, which is phi one plus a little error. And this is the gate error, or is the lack of gate fidelity that meets gate infidelity. And basically, if you apply now and the the induction here, right, the final state phi t tilde is in fact the real state that the, the ideal result, the real result, plus a bunch of errors. And if you perform here a bit of more computation, what you get out is that the difference between the true state and the computed state is uh, uh, less than the sum of the errors that each of the gate basically does uh, perform. And if you know by that the hardware vendor can control that all of the gates basically have a joint upper bound of the deviations, you know that the that the computation on the quantum computer uh, is a linear function or is the, the, that the error in the computation of a quantum algorithm is linearly bound um, uh, by this uh, maximum uh, gate error of the, of the you know, which is a, vice, a very nice formula, right? That basically means that computation scales even in case you have errors, if the errors are bounded by a fixed upper, upper number that is uh, typically the case in the today's quantum computers. So how do you measure? Now we are now trying to approach this world and find, try to find out which algorithms can be performed in this error prone world. So we need metrics of an algorithm and the metrics are called the depth and the width of the algorithm. If you take a look at this uh, abstract algorithm, these are here the different gates. These are two bit gates. This is a one uh, qu a qubit gate, right? Uh, each slice, it's called a layer or a level these gates are executed in parallel. These are executed in parallel. These are executed in parallel. So the number of levels that you need uh, one after the other in order to perform your algorithm is called the depth of the quantum circuit. And the width, the width is the number of qubits that the overall uh, algorithm does uh, manipulate. Here's a more, here's an example. If you take a look at this example, I, the algorithm designer has invented three levels, but what you can see is that this gate can be moved to the left because this gate does not manipulate the same qubits than this gate does manipulate. So you can push that to the left, you can push that to the left, that to the left, this level then is empty and you can move that over here. So what that basically means out instead of this algorithm of level three, what you get is you have an algorithm of depth uh, of depth two and the width is basically seven because all of the seven qubits are manipulated. A more concrete example is this uh, uh, circuit here. You see that the S could be moved over here. The H could be moved over here. Then you have the C naught that you can move over here and so on. So what results is here a circuit that has the depth three and the width three because not all qubits are manipulated but only the first the third and the fifth uh, qubit are manipulated. So the noisy algorithms that you have is, keep in mind, this is the gate, uh, this is the circuit, sorry. The gates are error prone, the qubits are error prone. So, and what you need to control is the rough estimation of the size of a quantum algorithm that can be performed without errors or with 
or the minor errors is that the width times the depth must be significantly less than one def defined uh, divided by the error rate of the of the machine that you execute the algorithm on. So what that means is if you take this uh, nice formula, well, you if you can basically uh, manipulate only a few qubits, then you have a, a very deep quantum, then you have many levels available that you can execute one after the other. So the, we call this a deep quantum algorithm, but the B deep quantum algorithm has the problem that when well, you can really simulate this algorithm on a classical machine based on the quantum simulator, um, because if you have up to 40 qubits, you can, you can simulate them. So, and if you can simulate them, you can't get the quantum advantage that we are all looking for. And that means we need to work with shallow quantum algorithm, an algorithm that uses many qubits, but if you use many qubits, that means W is, 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 is big, then the depth must be very small in order to stay below, uh, significantly below one divided by epsilon. So you can, in, uh, we come back to that, how we use that in order to estimate which algorithm can run on, on which machine at the end of the, of the presentation. So now you have an algorithm, you get an estimation whether it may run on a particular machine. <clears throat> what then happens is this algorithm is transformed to the gate set that is supported by the concrete machine, which is called the transpilation, sometimes also called cross compilation. <clears throat> Here you see screenshots from, from the IBM Quantum Experience Editor. He is the original circuit that I used to uh, use in this in the graphical editor. And here's what the transpiler, the cross compiler basically does. So it exchanges the gates here. So here's a typical, here's a typical example. Here's another example. I have three Hadamard gates here, two C knots. And if you take a look at the transpiled circuit, the depth did really increase. And this is what typically happen, most often happen. Here, the original circuit that I invented has a depth of three. But now the transpiled circuit has a depth of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. nine okay, right? So transpilation typically increases depth. That means if you take a look at an algorithm that is published, for example, in the paper, you really can't estimate what is the transpiled circuit that will be executed, in fact, on a concrete machine. You cannot estimate out of this, out of the published thing, whether it can run on a given machine or not. So, but sometimes, and this is only in a rare case, circuits may decrease the depth. But again, this is unfortunately only rarely the case. Here's another example of transpilation. That means one and the same circuit will be transpiled to different environments very differently. Here I asked the transpiler uh, to transpile it to a simulator. You get a significant increase of the depth. And here I transpiled it to a certain QPU and here the depth did not change. That means transpilation is really dependent on the, on the target machine, even of one at the same vendor. And that means because circuits are rewritten in the step in the course of transpilation, the implication is the depth of the circuit can often be reduced by shifting gates from right to the left, as I showed a couple of slides ago. That means without sacrificing the data flow, the, 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 the manipulation of the qubits. And this is mainly hardware independent. And hardware dependent rewrite is also required because if my circuit, if my circuit assumes the, the implementation of certain gates, but, in, but the provider of a quantum computer is implementing different gates in the concrete implementation of the quantum computing. It means I must map the, the, the logical gate, so to speak, to subroutines uh, of the gates that are implemented on the physical machine. And this typically, as we saw in the couple of examples, increases the depth of an algorithm. That means you need to inspect the transpiled circuit really to assess whether or not the circuit is executable on a certain machine. So next thing is, the uh, next problem that occurs is input preparation. So if you take a look at an algorithm edit as it is published in the paper, uh, you take a look at this thing here. It basically says here is the, here is the circuit, here is, uh, here is the unitary transformation. And each algorithm assumes a certain state that needs to be prepared in the quantum computer. And this input is then manipulated by the algorithm proper. And then you need to do a measurement. So we are now dealing with 
this problem that the algorithm assumes that a certain state is prepared. And some, uh, many algorithms don't tell you how to prepare the state. So for example, this is a very famous algorithm, the HHL algorithm, an algorithm that you can use to solve linear equations on a quantum computer. And the algorithm simply says, I assume that a certain state is prepared in my quantum computer before I algorithm begin. That means you have to take a look at what needs to be done to prepare the state that the algorithm does assume. So, and this is called state preparation. And here you have different alternatives. The alternatives are referred to analog encoding and digital encoding. Digital encoding is used if you need to perform some arithmetics and analog encoding is used if you need to do processing in some high dimensional feature space as you do often in, in machine learning. So we discuss uh, some of the of the of the uh, state preparation algorithms. There's a whole plethora of state preparation, like basis encoding that we are going to discuss, amplitude encoding, tensor product encoding, and much more. And uh, we are only discussing a couple of them. So basis encoding means that you start with a natural number, and you binary encode the natural number as a, as a series of zeros and ones. That means the zeros and ones are here the coefficients of the powers of, of, of two. And then you take the, the zeros and ones and basically uh, map the natural number to this base vector, right? This is the cat notation of a basis vector, right? So the so-called computational basis. Very simple, uh, very, very simple. So what you need to do is, you need to take a look at the number that you need to represent in the quantum computer, compute its uh, binary representation so that you have the digits B1 up to Bn. And here what you have is the Pauli X matrix, the negation. What you do is if B1 is zero, then X to the power of zero uh, does nothing. So that means you have zero here. If Bn is one, then X turns the zero state into the one state. So this is really how you see how you can very simply uh, uh, materialize a natural number in a quantum state. For this purpose, you need n qubits, no surprise, n digits and qubits, n gates, this Pauli x gates. It has the depth one. It doesn't need any helper uh, 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 qubits called n Chile uh, uh, qubits. Mm, very nice encoding. Next thing is how do we uh, materialize real numbers into a quantum computer? Well, you do this by approximating the real number up to k decimal places, because the real number typically is infinite number of decimal places. This is what you cannot represent. That means to basically compute the part before the comma, then the k decimal places after the comma, and here's an example, right? If you want to map 1.7 into its binary representation up to four decimal places, this is the binary representation. If you forgot how to compute the part after the comma, here's a little indication how the algorithm works. And if you watch the, uh, the video after the talk again, you can basically find out how the algorithm works. That means uh, 0 0.7 in, 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 digit, in, in a decimal representation is this uh, representation in binary representation. So 1.7 1 is 1011. 1, 1. So what you need to do is in a classical computer, you need to compute the representation of the real number in the binary representation. Then you generate the circuit based on the Pauli matrices as we saw before. The computer is in a ground state. You apply the operations here and then you get the quantum representation that now your algorithm can work on. And this uh, obviously can also be done uh, based on vectors. Here I have a vector with three components. I compute the binary representation of each of the components, right? This is what I've done here. And then I basically concatenate this, this binary numbers here, right? And then I get the basis encoding of this vector. And then I can even uh, work with a vector here. If I have a set of vectors, right? What I do is I compute the basis encoding of each of the vector, and then I take the uniform superposition. And this is then the state that I have prepared in my quantum computer. Here is what I did uh, uh, with two vectors only, right? Here's the uniform superposition. And if I take a look at the amplitude vector, then you see this is the single vector that results. And these state vectors are typically sparse vectors. We have a huge dimensional Hilbert space and only a couple of, of, of test data that you need to prepare. 
There are much better algorithms, but they take at least two hours to discuss quantum associative memory, how they work. So this is only a very simple algorithm. There are much better algorithms to do that. And analog encoding now is this amplitude encoding. The amplitude encoding takes, for the sake of simplicity here now, a unit length vector of, uh, and the dimension of the vector is a power of two. And then you simply take the components of the vector and take them as component of the computational basis vector. So the ith, -ith component of the vector becomes the, the coefficient of the ith computational base vector, right? Uh, this is the analog encoding, very simple. If the dimension of the vector is not the power of two, you basically add uh, zeros to the left or to the right uh, uh, until you reach uh, the, uh, the power of n here. What you need here is you require only uh, log to n qubits, so few qubits, very nice, right? If the dimension is two to the power of n, you only need n qubits, but terrible, 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 you require four to the power of n gates in order to compute this thing here. So this is nothing that you can really apply in, in today's NISC area in, in, in based on computers that are available. Uh, which is not the zero vector, you need to compute classically the norm of the vector, the length of the vector, and then use an amplitude encoding uh, with this coefficients here. And if you want to do linear algebra, you need to consider a matrix as a vector in this space, right? The coefficients of the, of the matrix are then the coefficients of the vector. And here you need to divide, divide by the norm of the, of the matrix. So this is again computed as a pre-processing step. We just saw that this amplitude encoding is computationally very expensive and likely not to succeed on the on, to, on today's rec, uh, on the today's computer. So what we, you can do is what we call the product encoding. A product encoding takes a vector, and each of the coefficients of the vector is basically encoded in a qubit by taking the cosine of x i times cat zero plus the sinus sine of of x i times mm, uh, times cat one. It means each qubit is basically mapped to this vector and they, then uh, each coefficient is mapped to this vector. Then you take the tensor product. That means you do it with n, n uh, qubits. This is here called now the tensor product encoding or sometimes also called the angle encoding. And the nice thing is you need n qubits and n gates uh, to prepare this state. So this is very nice if your algorithm requires this kind of a product encoding. And here's the circuit for it. So I take the rotation around the x-axis, uh, around the y-axis by angle uh, two times x. This is the rotation matrix. And if I apply uh, this rotation to the computational uh, cat zero vector, this is cosinus uh, cosine x times zero plus sine x times one. So exactly that what we wanted to have is, and this is here the circuit that does it. I need n qubits and n gates to implement this. So what I need to do is I pre-process the, on a classical computer. That means I generate the corresponding circuit and then I prepend this circuit to the algorithm proper and then I can run the algorithm. So here's now some sort of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a summary. Pre-processing on a classical computer means you need to decide on the encoding that you want to, want to use. Basically, this is given by the, by the algorithm proper. Right, then you compute the parameters of the encoding, you generate the gates for this encoding, then you generate the circuit, you prepend the circuit in front of the algorithm proper, and this is the overall algorithm is then executed, so the state is prepared, and then the algorithm can run. And the implication is, well, state preparation requires additional operations, so the, the operations that prepare the state and additional qubits, as well as classical pre-processing compared to the ideal algorithm that you read in your paper and think basically, this is a nice algorithm, I would like to run it. No, you need to do a bit uh, upfront. And so what we are doing is we are currently walking, working on, a, on the quantum pattern languages. So the introduction basically said that I'm working on pattern languages. So we have people in our institute that create patterns, best practices, how to term a algorithm into something executable. It only begins, right? We have this 10 plus patterns and we work from paper to paper and add more patterns to this pattern language. We also have already a website where the patterns are basically described and you see references uh, to the papers. 
The next thing you need to consider is oracle expansion. What the hell does this mean? It means that the proper algorithms that you read in your paper or that you invent basically assume that you have a subroutine which is called an oracle function. An oracle function that you can basically use in order to, uh, to retrieve some data, to perform some computation. This is a very famous algorithm of Deutsch that basically pr uh, uh, proved that an exponential speed up uh, compared to the best classical algorithm is given. And this is also making use of this algorithm, of this oracle function UF. This UF, is dependent on the functions that you need to compute. And here are a very simple function that basically uh, inverts a bit from zero to one or from one to zero. And without digging into details, this Oracle function is implemented by this uh, circuit here. That means what you need to do is in the Deutsch algorithm, you need to substitute this Oracle by this sub circuit and you need to invent this subcircuit if you don't uh, if you don't have it in some sort of a library, and that means the algorithm that has the level one to, that has the depth one two three in fact has the depth one two three four five. That means Oracle expansion two is changing the depth of the alg algorithm, and thus has a as a as a severe impact on whether the algorithm can run on a given machine or not. Here I have the very famous algorithm of Shaw. The algorithm, as you remember, is used to uh, uh, factorize a given number. This algorithm has the level, uh, the depth one, two, three. But in fact, what you see here is an or oracle function that needs to compute uh, exponential functions, that needs to do some division. So here's the module, the module, the uh, modulus function. Oh, sorry. And what you have is here the quantum Fourier transformation. It's another workhorse in quantum computing uh, uh, that you need in order to do some, yeah, some Fourier transformation. But, so first of all, as I said before, uh, sorry, what I said before, ah, I need to perform some computation. I need to do some division, some multiplication, some, some additions and so on. And here, here is the quantum algorithm that adds two numbers, X and Y. Right, what you see here is that even the simple addition algorithm again needs the quantum Fourier transformation, needs the inverse of the quantum Fourier transformation, needs a bunch of, of, of layers here. I'm not digging in, in, into the details of this. Here's a link to the paper, how you add numbers in a quantum computer. Here, uh, uh, the, even the quantum Fourier transformation that you see here on the former slide and the inverse is again yet another algorithm that has a fairly complicated and, and high depth uh, circuit. And if you put that and here you have, a, you have a circuit that multiplies two numbers, two small numbers. It's a, it's a three bit constant. It's a three qubit number and a six qubit number then is the result, right? This is only a fairly complicated um, uh, uh, circuit. So if you put all together, you take a look at the Shaw algorithm and say, well, gee, this looks very simple. No, it doesn't look simple because, because I'm sorry, because the uh, uh, the function that does this uh, computation of the of the modulus and the power of a, of a fixed number a uh, involves the addition algorithms, the multiplication algorithm. Here you see the quantum Fourier transformation that need to be expanded. This needs to be expanded. Here you see the quantum Fourier transformation again. So you get an impression that the algorithm, although it looks very nice in the paper, again, is expanding to a fairly high depth algorithm. So, uh, right, so and, and it is very unlikely that you find a computer that, uh, that does an arbitrary factorization these days already on a quantum computer. So implication of Oracle expansion is it, you require additional operations and additional qubits compared to the ideal algorithm yeah, and now we dive into the real physics of a quantum computer, into the connectivity. So, because what needs to be done in order to transform an algorithm to something executable on a given quantum computer? So I mentioned this C0 already a couple of times. The C0 is the controlled not X is the control bit, Y is the target bit. And what this gate, this two qubit gate does is, uh, if x, if the qubit is in status one, then y will be negated. 
if x is in state zero, y will be kept will be left in touch. And you need this C not operation because the C not plus these Pauli rotations is universal. That means every algorithm can be rewritten in term in series of C nots and Pauli uh, gates, right? This is well known as I mentioned in the in, in the introduction before. But hardware is, re is restricted. That means if you take a look at the real chip, this is a five qubit IBM chip, right? They're only, they're, uh, not all qubits are connected. So qubit one and zero are connected, but qubit one and uh, three are not connected. But in order to have um, a, a two qubit operator on these two qubits, they must be connected. So the C not, for example, can be applied to these two qubits, but it cannot, cannot be applied to these two qubits because there's no physical connection between the two qubits, right? So connectivity of a quantum ship is very, very important um, because it has impact as we will see in a few minutes on the depth of an algorithm. So here you see other topologies. These, these graph structures are called topologies of the, of, the, of the chips. This is what we saw before. This is the Yorktown chips. Here you see other IBM uh, uh, chips. Here you see a chip by Rigetti. And here you see that the connectivity is never the case that you have all uh, that you have a, a, a star shaped uh, uh, graph. That means each qubit is connected to each qubit, right? This is typically not the case, at least not with superconducting qubits as are predominant these days. So the next thing is you need a swap operator as we get clear in, in one or two slides, the swap operator exchanges the two qubits. So the value of X is stored in the value of, 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 of y and vice versa. That means if I have zero in x, right? Uh, you don't see if I have a zero in x, right? The zero is moved to the y qubit. And if I have a one in y, it appears in the one qubit. So you swap, you exchange, so to speak, the content of the two qubits, right? And then you can easily prove that the swap, in fact, is realized by three C not operators. Right here is the control bit on the upper line. Here's the control bit on the lower line. The control bit on the on the other, on the upper line again. So a swap is realized by a series of three C nots. Very easily, uh, very you can compute it very easily. So now we have the following effect on an algorithm. Here you have the ideal algorithm, a logical algorithm, and here you have the topology of the quantum computer that you want this logical algorithm to be performed on, right? And let's assume that the initial qubit allocation is that, the, that this qubit B1 is mapped to Q1, B2 is mapped to Q2 and so on. So then this logical algorithm is rewritten based on the topology and this initial qubit allocation on the real machine. So I can't perform B1 and B2 because uh, the C0 between B1 and B2 because uh, there is a connection between Q1 and Q2. But next, I would like to perform a C0 on B3 and B4, but B3 is mapped to Q3, B4 is mapped to Q4, there's no connection. So what I need to do is I need to swap B2 and B3. So I, meet, I need to swap Q3 and Q2, sorry. And, ah, and then, then, the qubit B3 is now what was original uh, the bit B2, and now I can perform the C0 because the control bit is now in this line and the target bit is still in this line. This is now this thing that I applied. Next, I would like to apply this C0 between B2 and B3, but B2 and B3 got exchanged. That means the control bit was supposed to be B2, but B2 is now in this line. That means I need to make this the control bit, this is now the target bit. But what happens, the rotation should be applied to B2, but B2 is now on this line. I need to move this gate uh, to this line. Finally, I would like to apply this C0 between B1 and B2, but uh, B1 must be moved, is now moved here. I apply this swap here so that B3 is here, B1 is here because B2 here is the B2, B2 is in this line, and now I can apply the C0 here. And what I need to measure is, I need to be careful what I measure because here B1 is now in the second line, B3 is in the first line, and so on. So you basically see the topology has immediate impact 
on rewriting the algorithm proper. And now I need to substitute finally the swap by the three C naught, by the corresponding C naught gates, series of C naught gates. And what you see is the algorithm, the logical algorithm that had a, a depth one, two, three, four, at the sudden has the depth one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? So the topology really influences uh, whether a given algorithm can be implemented on a certain machine or not. But it gets even a bit more uh, tricky here. So typically, the two qubit operations along different connections between two qubits have different success rates. So here's a certain topology that I dreamt up. And what you need to understand is that the, that the physical connection between these qubits uh, has certain chances to succeed in terms of the error rates of a two qubit operator. So let's assume that I need to apply a, a, a two qubit operator between uh, Q1 and Q3. So what I need to do is I swap Q3 to Q2, and then I apply the two qubit operator between Q1 and Q2, and the success rate, success, success rate is 30% times 50%. That means I have 15% success rate of this overall swap and then applied with omega. Take a look at this path. If I swap Q3 along this path and then apply omega, the overall success rate will be 33%. Although I have more swap gates now introduced, right? Um, uh, my success rate is higher than applying a single sw swap uh, uh, here uh, on, uh, in, in the first situation, right? In the first situation, I have one swap, and here I have five swaps, but my success rate is likely higher. So the success rate of the qubits connections influence the number of swaps that I uh, may perform uh, as well as the error rates of the two qubit operation. That means even worse, the success rates, the weights on the graph here change over time, right? Because the, the connection, the physical connections between uh, the qubits are volatile over time. They change over time. This is why quantum computers are recalibrated uh, regularly. So that means if I am aware of the of the of, of the timely modifications of the success rate, right? Then uh, I need to find out what the initial allocation of the qubits are. What I did before is I mapped qubit B1 to qubit 1, qubit B2 to qubit 2, but now we are getting smarter. So what I do is I do the following. Here is my quantum circuit, right? I apply uh, uh, Pauli X on qubit 0, controlled X between Q0 and Q1. And here are the success rates. What I do is I compute the success rates of all connected subgraphs of length three because I need only uh, 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 two qubit operations C naught on uh, three uh, consecutive gates. So I compute the success rate of Q1 to Q, Q, Q3. This is 15%, yeah, 0 0.5 times 0 0.3. Q2, Q3, Q4 has 0 0.3 times 0 0.8 is 0 to 4 and so on. Once I computed that, I choose the mapping with the highest success rate. That means my qubit zero will be mapped to qubit Q5 in my topology. Qubit one will be mapped to qubit Q6 in my topology. And this is based on the success rates of the connections between these uh, Q, uh, between these um, three uh, qubits here. Let's see whether this really uh, happens in practice. Here I have a circuit. And here I have the topology of an IBM quantum experience computer. And the color code in the topology indicates the success rates of single qubit operations and two qubit operations. So green color means highly successful. Pink color basically means, or, or, or purple color basically means low success rate. Blue means mediocre success rate. So what happens here is, here is the, the result of the transpiler. And what you see is, you need to understand this U3 is basically this Pauli X, X operator. U3 is, um, is a gate that is natively supported by the IBM machine. So it translates this X into this U3 operation. It's a rotation on the uh, block sphere around three uh, uh, angles. 
Um, and what you see is that the X operation, the U3 is applied on Q3. That basically means that the qubit Q1 that I have uh, uh, programmed is mapped by the transpiler to qubit three. And why is that the case? Because qubit three has a very high success rate um, in terms of single qubit errors, right? This is why I move it, this is why the transpiler maps qubit one to the third physical qubit. And then you see here the swap, the swap is the, then I need to swap qubit one to qubit three, right? And so what, what is happening here? Qubit one, as I said before, is mapped to the physical qubit three and qubit four is mapped to the qubit zero here. Why is that the case? Because as I said before, the physical qubit three has best error rate for the two rotation operation that I apply here. U three is around two angles. And then I apply X on this third qubit and the highest success rate for C naught is on the connection between zero and one. This is here a green color. This is why now the transpiler swaps this qubit to this position one. That means I swap three to position one. And then I can apply the C naught between qubit one and qubit zero. But one is now my Q1 in the algorithm and Q4 on the algorithm. So if you didn't get it from my speech, take the time and go to the YouTube video, stop the video, read the text, and I'm sure you, 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 you will read it. As I said before, the success rate changes over time. So what I did is one or two days later, I took the same circuit and let it run on the same machine. But what you see here is the color code has basically changed or the colors did basically change. That means that the success rate of one qubit operations now is very different and the success rate of the two qubit operation is now best between these Q2 qubits. And bear with me, mm, uh, the transpiler did something different. And please take a look at the YouTube video later on uh, uh, to read the text here, right? So this is the impact on recalibration of a quantum computer on the transpiler result. So the implication of the connectivity basically is the connectivity of the QPU, the topology, implies that you need to inject additional swap operations uh, into the ideal algorithms and keep in mind that the swap consists out of three C nots and the success rate of qubit connections also influences the number of swaps as well as the error rate of the two qubit operations as I have uh, shown in the, in the examples here. That means if you consider the success rate of qubit connections as well as the error rate of one qubit operations during qubit allocations, Right. This has influence on the reliability of the execution. And the last two slides is basically shown that the, the, in the, in the transpilers uh, that work in industry really does what I've shown here. The final thing problem is readout errors. Readout means once the algorithm finished, you need to measure the results in order to find out what your algorithm has computed. So what you do is here, here you have this uh, HHL algorithm again. What you do is you need to read out, you read out here uh, the, the low level qubits, uh, you sample them and then you basically get the result. And I introduce here a word uh, what that I explain on the next slide, unfolding. And in order to unfold a measured result, make it more precise, you need to periodically run this bunch of, of circuits that I'm also going to explain. That means read out in order to, to correct read out errors, uh, you need some classical pre-processing plus additional circuits that you need periodically in order to compute this matrix C here. So read out errors, why do they happen? The reason is that read out that measuring qubits takes six, 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 sometimes significantly longer than the decoherence time of the qubit basically is. That means a qubit may flip uh, under measurement may flip from one to zero and other errors may basically happen. That means readout errors correspond to a disturbed probability distribution of your measured results, right? You think that you measure the result the computer has computed, but in fact, because measurement takes quite some time, some qubits may basically be, 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 be changed. You get a disturbed distribution that you need to correct. And this is done based on a technique that is called unfolding. Unfolding means you want to reconstruct 
the true undisturbed distribution that your algorithm produced out of the measured distribution that got uh, produced because of readout errors. Assume that T, so T is the true distribution that the algorithm has computed and the gray stuff is the measured distribution, right? Here you have the different values that you want to measure. And here the height is basically giving you the count how often a certain value has been measured. And this is, so to speak, the probability that the value does occur. And now what I need is I need the matrix C, the components of C, Cij is the probability that I measured the value I, although the true value was J. That means there is a relation between the true distribution and measured distribution. That means T equals C times M and C is called the calibration matrix or response matrix or different papers have different names for it, right? And correcting readout errors means I need to determine this calibration matrix. And then I compute the true uh, thing here based on the, on the measured thing. This is one of many different unfolding methods. There are other unfolding methods, me methods to compute an undisturbed distribution out of a measured distribution. This is what unfolding means. And I'm only presenting here one of this uh, 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 unfolding method. So the first problem is how do I compute this matrix C? Well, what I do here is I, I run this uh, two to the power of n circuits periodically in order to determine the calibration matrix. Here, I prepare the zero state, the ground state uh, in my quantum computer and immediately measure it. So I suppose I measure all zeros here. The next circuit prepares a one in the first qubit and leaves the other qubits unchanged. So I expect to measure one zero zero zero. Here, I expect to measure zero one zero zero. And finally, I change all the zeros to a one and I expect to measure one 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 one. So what I do is I apply the circuit CI. These are the different CIs. And uh, measuring means I sh it should result in the number I that I measure, but I measure J because measurement takes too long, readout errors happen. And if I perform CI M times, and if I measure J K times, then the entry CIJ is K divided by M, right? CI, remember that was the probability that I measure I, although the true value was J. So here's an example. I uh, run the circuit C1. So I expect to measure 1000, 100%, but unfortunately I measure uh, 1000 only in 91%. 90, I measure 00, 0 in 3% of all cases. 0011 in 1.1% of the cases and so on. It means out of this distribution here, this distribution, these percentages basically give the entries in the calibration matrix, right? This is how I compute the calibration matrix. So in, uh, the implications are, so correcting readout errors requires additional operations, namely the calibration circuits to determine the calibration matrix and you do that regularly from time to time, especially when you know that your quantum computer got recalibrated. You don't need to compute the calibration ma matrix for each execution of the ideal algorithm uh, because the calibration matrix is stable for quite some times. But to correct the readout errors, I require again classical post-processing. I need to take the measured calibration, apply the calibration matrix to the measured results, and then I have my undisturbed thing. So the comments in practice is, luckily the diagonal elements of the calibration matrix, matrix are typically significantly higher than off diagonal elements, because that means I measure the measured and true values are often the same. You saw in my example that in 91%, I measured the real results. The calibration matrix is QPU dependent. Absolutely. It even changes over, over time. We call it calibration drift. It means you need to, to compute the calibration matrix regularly. And typically QPU with high connectivity, the more via, so to speak, between the qubits are, the higher is the readout noise. This is why, the, why you can't via based on current superconducting technique, for example, uh, uh, high connectivity. And unfortunately, determining C has exponential effort. That means 
uh, if you have n qubits, you need to run two to the power of n uh, circuits. So that means this is only practical if you have a small number of qubits, right? Otherwise, you only compute the calibration matrix without having time for doing real work. But as I mentioned before, there are other unfolding techniques. So take a look to the literature if you want to understand that better. So here's the summary slide, so to speak, of readout errors. You need to do some classical pre-processing. That means you generate the calibration circuits, you execute the circuits, you measure the results, and then you compute the calibration matrix, and then you need to invert it. You store the inverted matrix because you need it in order to correct the readout error. So what happens then at runtime is, once your algorithm is done, you do a readout, you get the measured distribution M, and the true distribution is uh, computed by uh, the calibration matrix inverted times the matrix uh, times the uh, measured distribution, and this is then the most likely uh, uh, the error the the measurement with uh, uh, less errors. So I sum because this is very difficult. Difficult. What we implemented one of the many components that we built in this Planck project that I mentioned at the very beginning is we built a NISC analyzer, a component that helps you to determine whether a given algorithm may run on a given machine. So what the NISC analyzer does from a very high level point of view, we take an algorithm, analyze it in terms of depth and width, for example, and say, okay, this is a reasonable algorithm, right? Or you may ask the NISC analyzer, I have yet that you have access to two quantum computers. You ask the um, NISC analyzer which quantum computer has the highest success rate. This is what the NISC analyzer does. In order to do so, the NISC analyzer needs metadata, data about the quantum computer, which is called in, in database uh, and, 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 and so provenance information. Provenance information is information about particular computations, about data about processes and so on. And the goal of provenance information is to ensure reproducibility, understandability of results, the quality of the results. And this is important for quantum computing because the machines are all noisy. We are in the NISC area, noisy intermediate scale quantum. That means they are, uh, you have decoherence of qubits, gate infidelity. You have many different hardware implementations, superconducting machines, trapped iron machines, uh, experimental optical machines. So what we do is um, the operations are hardware dependent. So the basic operations, as I indicated already when I've shown you the IBM Q experiments that we did, the implement implementation dependent. Different machines support different gates, for example. For example, if you take a look at, at Penny Lane, they support gates that I didn't introduce before, like squeezing, Fox state. They are mm, specific to optical quantum computers. Right, and on IBM machines, you have U1, U2, U3 machines. You have on Rigetti, the physically implemented uh, gates are uh, a rotation around the x-axis, uh, control Z, and so on. And this NISC analyzer must be aware about the implementation of the hardware. And we have, uh, and, and for this purpose, we build a provenance uh, component. The provenance component uh, can collect information about the machines. Right, uh, many of the machines provide APIs where you can uh, get information about T1, T2 time, uh, connectivity, uh, two, two qubit errors, and, and so on. Then we have an aggregation component that performs, uh, uh, for example, computation for the calibration matrix and stores it. And then we, we analyze the depth and the breadth and put all the information together to do what I've shown on, on, on this slide here. So you pass the quantum algorithm to this NISC analyzer. What the quantum algorithm does is it prepends the data preparation part that you need in order that the algorithm needs uh, in order to work. So we take out of a library um, or, we, or we compute it, um, this, uh, uh, this circuit that materializes, prepares the state as required by the algorithm. Next, what we do is we take a look at the oracles and expand them based on an initial library that we basically have. We expand the uh, oracles. Then we take a look at the QPUs that came out of the provenance uh, stuff that we did before. So we know which gates are natively supported and basically do this gate mapping here. Then again, provenance information uh, uh, gives me information about T1, T2 times, 
um, uh, connectivity of the machine. So what we do is we compute execution readiness based on this thing that we have here on, 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 the, on, on, the, on, the, on the result after the gate mapping. We have the depth and the width and we understand how many swaps can be done, uh, must be done. So we basically compute the execution readiness and say, okay, this QPU may run your uh, algorithm, this QPU may run the algorithm. And finally, once you decided for a given QPU, we even generate code for you that you can use in order to do readout error mitigation. So we, can, we basically then retrieve the uh, calibration matrices that you can apply uh, to correct your measured results. And this is embedded somehow in the software development lifecycle, right? In the first presentation, Kieran had this lifecycle too and said that, that, in, that in his world, right, you need certain steps. You don't need certain steps here. So I refer to the first video where we had quantum accelerators. So the, the basically, basically made some of these steps superfluous, but we need it in, this is the life cycle we are following in our Planck project. So just to very briefly summarize, uh, today's era of quantum computer is determined by decoherence, gate infidelity, readout errors, connectivity, all the stuff that I mentioned in my presentation. That means you, you need data preparation, Oracle expansion, and so on. These are additional problems that modify your algorithm uh, before you can run it. All these problems can be addressed, as I have shown, but it requires, unfortunately, additional gates, additional qubits. That means the resources available for your quantum algorithm, for the ideal quantum algorithm, is further reduced. Right? So you need, this is the main message of this talk here, you need to though roughly analyze an algorithm, whether it has chances to be executed on a certain QPU. Right? You may take the algorithm and run it, but then you will be frustrated that the algorithm can't run on a given QPU. So the takeaway from this uh, presentation is be smart, Deep, think deeper about it, right? Or use the transpilers of the machine or use the NISC analyzer that is open source in some GitHub repo, right? Uh, uh, this is a tool, it is in, it's, it's, it's in an initial state, but we are continuously working on it. This will be a tool that supports you in this kind of decision making. And here are, while you have questions, if you have questions, the references that you may take a look at that covered some of the stuff or most of the stuff that I presented. Thank you very much for listening. No, thank you. I mean, this was, uh, well, quite quite a, say, a storm of information. This was really cool. So th there, there have been already some questions uh, on chat. I, I will try okay. to unmute people who, who made them so that they can. Gustavo, yes. do you want to, to, to um, well, ask your question with your own voice? Would be great. <laughs> I can also ask it. I'm asking Gustavo to unmute. Maybe something is going uh, wrong. I don't. Uh, know. Yeah, I have a. Uh, this is Kuhn Bertels. Uh, can I ask you? Kuhn, hi. Sure. Yeah, hi. Sure. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. So, so you highlight many of the problems when when you're already a long time, relatively long time in quantum. You have to solve many of these things, and uh, um, so I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I agree with everything that you said. Yeah? But I have a, a, maybe a, another simpler solution, which may not turn out to be so simple, is to assume now perfect qubits. So I do not look at decoherence. I do not look at, at the errors in the gate, gate, the quantum gate operations. So that already reduces a lot of the problems that you, you showed, this round graph, uh, which and, and in many of those steps, you, you, you do take into account so many of the errors that we have to solve, apparently. But if we put everything on one stack, what is what what do we as as non-physics people to really solve so that is a bit my my question that's why i now uh, uh, adopt in 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 whatever i'm doing right now with with the people that i have is i'm assuming perfect qubits so already look away of a lot of the problems that propagate up to the applications and and that will make every programming and algorithm design extremely difficult so that is that is my, my my question uh, and, and it's not only a question, it's a comment. It's absolutely a valid way for us as researchers to assume perfect machines, error corrected machines, but they will be out. If you take a look at Google's and IBM's roadmap, 
they will have the, the roadmap says that end of this decade, both companies will have 1 million qubits and this make up what up to 1000 perfect qubits, error corrected qubits. So in, 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 in our situation, in our projects, plural, uh, we work with application companies with, no, with, with companies that would like to apply, want to detect the potential of a quantum computer already now. And this is why we live in this NISC world and run the experiments and find out what can be done today. And very surprising, no, not very surprising, surprisingly, um, we run a bunch of machine learning algorithms and some of the machine uh, learning algorithms provide better results than traditional algorithms. So you can already achieve in selected areas uh, benefits without having to assume completely error corrected, perfect qubits and so on. But Cohen, it is absolutely valid that you decide with your team, I uh, wait uh, a couple of more years until the machines are uh, error free, error corrected. Yeah, thank you, because you, you do mention uh, Google and IBM and they work yeah. on superconducting qubits. So there are yeah. so many other qubit technologies still in competition with each other. So yes. I'm, I'm a computer engineer, so I'm, I'm one layer lower than you. So I, yeah. cannot, I cannot isolate myself in only one technology. So that is, so I fully agree with, you, with your statement, but I don't have that luxury, so to speak, that I can wait and, and see or only choose for superconducting because yeah. I speak with people that look at photonics. And maybe my oral, sure. well, my oralists know that's maybe not, not the right, yeah. right uh, 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 candidate these days. Yeah, but I look at different kinds of people. And so they have all different problems. They end up with sure. the same kind of errors and, and, and challenges, but it's implemented in a completely different way. And so, so I, I agree, but it's, it's, I don't have the luxury to, to wait <laughs> that, that, that long. Yeah. Maybe you want to switch to software, then you, <laughs> you have the luxury. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, that, that's something I, we, we might do as well. That, that is true. Okay, okay thank you very cool. much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kun, as well. Thank you, Kun. So, uh, moving on to the questions that are on chat, uh, I, I'm, well, I, I, sh I probably should read them out loud. So, this was a question by Gustavo Wizidiu. And the question was uh, What's the downside of increasing the number of connections between qubits? The downside is uh, that you need very likely more swaps, right? If you, if you reduce the number of connections, right? Then you need to swap the qubits around in order to apply the two qubit gates. And you always need to apply C knots, right? Because C knots are very important. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> C knots are important uh, because they are not only needed uh, in the universal gate set, but C knots are also needed to uh, uh, create entanglement and you can prove that you need entanglement to get a real speed up in contrast to traditional uh, algorithms. So you need connectivity, the higher, the better. But as I indicated, the more connections you have, the more error prone with today's uh, technology it basically is. Although I need to refine this, this is true for superconducting qubits, right? In, in iron trap qubits, you can basically move qubits around. This is faster. You can reduce errors and so on. As Cohn already indicated, right? The hardware really has a lot of impact here on the algorithms. Okay, great. Thanks. Another question, I think it's by Payman. Um, what are the restrictions imposed to possible qubit topologies? Uh, can you re read the question again? Sure, of course. Oh. The question is, what are the restrictions imposed to possible qubit topologies? There are tons of different topologies. So I, uh, maybe the person who asked the question, can you unmute him or her so that... I can try to, I can. Uh, Payman, uh, I think you are unmuted now. Do you want to, to, to clarify a bit what you mean? Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for the good presentation. Actually, uh, my question was, uh, you talked about uh, qubit mapping and qubit swap. Do we consider uh, physical qubits or logical qubits? Uh -huh. um, so the logical and physical qubits have, that, that I, na I named them have nothing to do with logical qubits in the sense of error corrected qubits. So the problem that I sketched is you write your algorithm and the qubit that you assume in your algorithms, I call them logical algorithms, because these are the algorithms that your algorithm assumes are, are there. And then what happens during transpilation time, as I indicated in some of my slides, 
these logical qubits, the qubits of your algorithm, are mapped to the physically implemented qubits. And what I try to show in the presentation is that you have tons of problems there. You need to choose the best qubits. You need to consider in advance which two qubit operations you have further on in your algorithm. And this is even an NP complete problem to come up with an optimal mapping of your logical qubits to the physically implemented qubits on your machine, considering the error rates of the qubits and the connectivity between and the connections between the qubits. A very deep optimization problem. Thank you very much. Thank you as well for the question. You're welcome, Paimon. And then the final one, at least on chat, is again by Gustavo. I, I was um, suggesting Gustavo to unmute himself, but well, something must be going on, so I'll, I'll read it again. <laughs> uh, uh, and the question is about, the, about encoding algorithms in the literature. Is there some yeah. list of best uh, algorithms in terms of performance or most known ones? Uh, I'm not aware whether there's a, 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 a recent paper that compares all of them. So what I did is I have tons of papers, a couple, not tons, a couple of papers, different uh, encoding algorithms. And what I often do is, uh, so I, of course I can share the links to the, to, to the different papers, but there's no, no article that basically compares, a recent article that compares all of them. So you need to find that out by yourself and which is important, you need to inspect your algorithm, right? The algorithms typically assume a certain encoding and then you need to find out uh, which kind of coding is it and how, what circuits can you run in order to achieve this state that the algorithm does assume. So there's no simple way, but the pattern language that I indicated briefly is listing, I guess in the meantime, seven or eight encodings and we discuss in which situation, which of the encoding uh, pattern is applicable. And I may send tomorrow a list to this to the um, to the to the tool to the pattern language that we have online already. Okay, there's, there, there was actually already one more question on chat. I'm sorry, uh, it's yeah, by Aritra. Right. Aritra, do you want to 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 pose the question yourself, please? Yeah, uh, thanks, Frank, for the talk. So uh, my question is like uh, the NISC analyzer, the open source tool that you talked about, is yeah. kind of. Uh, like bridges all the things that you talked about in the talk, like all the different factors. So did you come across any real world quantum application that already passes the test or like are most likely to pass the test in the near future? No, no, so, uh, so what, what we are doing is, uh, so let me do some expectation management. Right, we work on this NIST, NISC analyzer for more than a year. It is at a certain stage. It does, most, it, it does already a lot of the, of the stuff that I've shown to you and we use this in our own experiments, when we want to run an algorithm on, on a given machine, we use this prototype already and the NISC analyzer basically says, give up. Or we go to the NISC analyzer and say, I have these two or three machines, uh, which one should I use? And the NISC analyzer said, okay, these two out of the three may qualify, you may have chances to run it. So it works, it's at an experimental stage and I can share the link to the, to the GitHub repo if you want to play around with it. Yeah, thank you. So you mentioned like if you give it like three quantum uh, QPUs, let's say, uh, it yeah. says that let's use one of them and not the other two. So like, uh, does it kind of tell you then yeah. uh, it, it will give a quantum advantage already in one of them because like- No, 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 oh, oh, no, 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 right? sorry. Oh, now, now, now I finally got your question. So it does not analyze whether you get an advantage. The NISC analyzer is far more simple. The NISC analyzer only says, this algorithm has a chance to succeed on this machine. The well, NISC analyzer does no miracle, doesn't say this is advantage. It's a very simple software engineering tool. It gets an input, it gets an algorithm as an input and it basically says it may succeed on this and this machine. Yeah. But it okay. doesn't say anything about quantum advantage. Yeah, okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, any say final question? By anyone, I don't see hands raised. Let me just double check that. No, and also no further questions on chat. So I guess I guess that's it. So again, Frank, this was really, really interesting. Uh, personally, I enjoyed it a lot. I'm sure this is going to be, say, a landmark presentation in the context of QC Talks. 
uh, and generally on, on quantum. So again, thanks for everything. Thank you. Um, and well, uh, and thank you uh, all as well for joining and for asking questions. Um, well, and hopefully we see you soon. Okay. Thank you so Thanks for the invitation again. Thank okay. you.